If you'd like to grab your Bibles, crack it open to the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22. Here we go. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the city's main street. The tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for healing the nations, and there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. People will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, because the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. When I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had shown them to me. But he said to me, Don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you, your brothers, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Then he said to me, Don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. Let the filthy still be filthy. Let the righteous go on in righteousness. Let the holy still be holy. Look, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to attest these things to you for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. Both the spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life freely. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life and the holy city which are written about in this book. He who testifies about these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with everyone. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Earlier this year, my family and I got to go to a concert of one of our favourite bands. They're called For King and Country. We got the tickets at the beginning of the year and we waited excitedly uh, to be able to see them live and the concert did not disappoint. If you don't know this band, For King and Country, I suggest check them out. They have got some banger songs like uh, Fine Fine Life, that's one of my favourites, Joy, Shoulders. But there's one song that just the other day my son Levi asked me about. The song is called, What Are We Waiting For? And it got me thinking about where we've been in Revelation. Thinking the same question. What are we waiting for? In Revelation, we've had the letters to the churches, a description of what they are going through now. We've seen a glimpse into heaven this perfect picture, image of all created things, worshipping God and the Lamb. We've seen the judgments poured out on the earth. We've seen the fall of Babylon. We've seen the fall of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. 
And all of it has been with really intense imagery, hasn't it? But as all that unfolds, as all the judgments are brought about, as John's readers in the early church are struggling with their place in the world as aliens and strangers, and then as we too, as we struggle as strangers and aliens, what is waiting for those who endure in Jesus? What are we waiting for? Or what are we preparing for? There have been little hints along the way, but we get to chapters 21 and 22 and we get a magnificent picture of what it is we have been waiting for and not just waiting, but preparing for. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for where we've been so far in the book of Revelation. Thank you for the comfort and confrontation As we work through these last two chapters now, help us to see your perfect picture, to be assured and find great comfort and joy in the future that you have prepared for your people. Amen. All right, let's get into point two, the renewal. Last week we heard about the final destruction of Satan and the two feasts. And then at the end of chapter 20, the judgment before the throne. We heard what happens to those that whose names are not written in the book of life, but what's in store for those whose names are. Come with me to chapter 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. There's a new heaven and a new earth. The old is gone, it's wiped away, because that's where the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet had their foothold. They're all gone now, and so is their dwelling place. Then John, he sees the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Now, through this chapter, you're going to see that there's two images used, the bride and the city, but both are talking about the same thing. They describe the people of God. These are the faithful and enduring ones the gathered community of the redeemed. It's the church. And in verse 2, they're described as a bride adorned for her husband. I loved Jade's kids talk there because when I remember back to my wedding day, I just remember seeing Hales come down the aisle and going, whoa, that woman is gorgeous. And I get to be with her forever. And that's also, and she's still gorgeous. Please don't hear me wrong there. She's still gorgeous. But... Magnify that image by at least 100,000 million and that is how God has prepared his people to come and live in the new heaven and new earth. How good is that? Did you notice too that the bride is prepared before it descends? So when you become a Christian or as it's phrased in, in John's gospel, when you are born again, You are now a citizen of this city, of this new Jerusalem. We're already made new and ready because of what Jesus has done on the cross. So when we get to the new heaven and the new earth, we'll see the full consummation of that. But think, already, we are citizens of that city. Remember that, because later we'll get to the city and look some more at that. But for now, let's move on to verses 3 and 4. Have a listen to these amazing promises from God that he's making from his position of power on the throne. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Now these words of dwelling point us back to Genesis, Garden of Eden. In the garden, there were perfect relationships. God to man, man to man, man to earth. But then sin enters and it falls apart. All these relationships are broken. The relationship between God and man is broken. Relationships between people are broken. The relationship between man and the earth is broken. 
And the repercussions of that are seen in the physical, the emotional, and the mental lives of humans. But then we look at chapter 21, verse 3 here. God dwells with his people, and as he does, he restores all these relationships again. You see what he promises in verse 4. There is complete renewal and regeneration, physical, mental, emotional. And that can be trusted. God says so in the next few verses. He gives his qualifications for trusting his word. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is eternal. And then he states, it is done. It's the same phrase that was used in chapter 16, verse 17, when the last judgment is poured out. It is done. He is in complete control. And he has been since the beginning, and he will be for all eternity. And he will dwell with the people who have accepted his free invitation to drink from the spring of the water of life. Do you remember in John chapter 4, the woman at the well? Jesus talks to her about the living water. This is the gracious gift of God, of Jesus. It's the gospel. And he says, accept my gift, be the bride and come and dwell with me forever. What an invitation. That's so good. So for that's the future for the thirsty. These that the conquerors who have persevered in the faith. But then there's this little warning. Verse eight points out who will not be there. Verse eight, but the cowards faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. This list, these are all fruits of the beast, aren't they? They're they're descriptions of the members of Babylon. And for that community, that future is grim. That's an understatement. Have, Have any of you ever seen those smoking ads? where they use this phrase that says quitting is hard, the alternative is harder. We know from the letters to the churches in chapters 2 and 3, followers of Jesus are having a tough time. It's hard. But the alternative is so much worse. How does that make you feel then, knowing that there are those around you that are going to experience that alternative? The future for the followers of the Lamb at this point in the chapter sounds pretty darn good. The realities of life for those that experience the second death, well, that's not positive in any way. But the reality of life for those in the new heaven and new earth is amazing. Now, that brings me to point three, the reality. What is it going to be like in this new heaven and new earth? We've already seen some encouragements in this, uh, that God will dwell with his people and make all things new. But now let's get some more details. So we're going to read uh, chapter 21, verse 9. Then one of the seven angels who had held the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came and spoke with me. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Hey, it's the bowl angels again. I love these guys. How good are they? We've got one back talking to us again. But this time, a bit different. Do you remember who he was talking about last time? It was Babylon, that city. But now he's going to describe another city. Only this time the city is not described in terms of judgment, but in terms of its radiance. Again, we've got the dual title going on, city and bride. We've got to remember these images stand for the church, the people of God, the endurers and the perseverers. So first, let's look at the way the quality of the city is described. Do you see in the description of the city from verse 10 to 21, I know it's a big chunk, but there's so many radiant terms used. In verse 11, her radiance was like a precious jewel. In verse 18, the building material of its walls was jasper and the city was pure gold, clear as glass. And then you get all the jewels and you get all the, all the pearls. How glorious and resplendent is this image? But who is it that brings the radiance and the glory. 
Because if we're saying that the New Jerusalem is a picture of God's people, surely it's not us that bring that radiance. Because we're flawed, aren't we? And we're sinful. So where does that radiance come from? Well, it comes from God. Have a look in verse 11. The city is arrayed with God's glory. God's creation, man, was made good in the garden. But in the new heaven and the new earth, this creation will be infinitely more beautiful, not because of the creation itself, but because of the creator, who now will dwell eternally with his creation. Let's go on to uh, the foundations for this city. Look from verse 12 with me. The city had a massive high wall with 12 gates. 12 angels were at the gates. The names of the 12 tribes of Israel's sons were inscribed on the gates. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. The city wall had 12 foundations, and the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb were on the foundations. Did you see these two groups of 12 in there? The gates with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel's sons and the foundations of the wall with the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. This city is founded on God's redeeming acts. you got the 12 tribes representing the old covenant. Here we're thinking Abraham, Moses, David. We're thinking the Exodus, when God rescued his people from Egypt, brought them out, and then made this promise to be their God and they would be his people. Doesn't that sound familiar from what we've heard earlier here? And then you have the new covenant. You've got the 12 apostles, those men who followed Jesus around, who learned from him, who witnessed firsthand his death and resurrection and then continued to carry on his work. This is how this city stands because of these redeeming acts of God. The church can only exist because of God's grace in bringing it together and building it. He and his redeeming acts are central to it. Now have a look at verses 22 and 23. I did not see a temple in it because the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because the glory of God illuminates it and its lamp is the Lamb. So the temple, the place where God would dwell with his people, it's not needed anymore. He dwells himself now with the people. The Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. God and Jesus will live with the people. Now in Old Testament times, in order to bring your worship offerings to to God, you had to go to the temple, you needed somebody to go in and be the intermediary. Well, that's not needed anymore. There is no intermediary. The citizens have full access to God and the Lamb. And the radiance of God and the Lamb will negate the need for the sun. Again, another moment where the good design in Genesis, in chapters 1 and 2, is made perfect. The sun made on the fourth day to light up the day and the moon for the night. But they're not needed anymore. The Lamb is the lamp and the glory of God will illuminate. All right, well, how about who's in this city? Have a look in verse 24. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never close by day because it will never be night there. They will bring the glory and honour of the nations into it. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those written in the Lamb's book of life. So this will be a place for all nations. And I mean, we've had reminders of this all the way through Revelation, haven't we? Even in the memory verse, from every tribe and language and people and nation, God is bringing people from everywhere in. But again, do you see, there is a warning for those that are not in. Nothing unclean, no one who does what is detestable or false. God cannot abide sin, and so it will not be in this city, nor will there be any remnant of it. Not even Satan is getting into this place like he did in the Garden of Eden. 
Only those written in the Lamb's book of life will experience life in this new creation. That leads us on to what it'll be like. There have been little glimpses of this, but uh, have a look. 22 verses 3 to 5 with me now. Uh, Halfway through. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. People will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun because the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. So firstly, you've got what the citizens are doing. They're worshipping God. Remember the beginning of Revelation? In particular, chapters 4 and 5, it started with worship and now it finishes with worship. God will receive all the honour due to him from his servants. Secondly, the citizens are going to see him face to face. How good will that be? Here's a tricky bit. Will it be God the Father or will it be Jesus? Look, we're not really sure. But the personal relational aspect of these two chapters comes out again. God will dwell with his people. And third, it's going to be forever. There'll be no end to this glorious existence with the Saviour, worshipping him eternally. Doesn't that all just sound terrific? It's just wonderful. You know what's really terrific? This is another one of those now and not yet moments. Because what did the city represent again? It represents the church, the people of God. This is actually a partial reality for us now. As followers of Christ, you are saved into this community. It's a community that's based on the redeeming acts of God. It's a community that worships the true and living God. As members of that community, we have God dwell with us as the Holy Spirit in us. Right now, we are the new Jerusalem. We are already made flawless in Jesus. And one day, we will see that fully realised as we are brought into the new heaven and new earth where we will be fully prepared by God to live eternally with the Lamb as he dwells with us face to face. Now, do you see coming to church like that? That as we meet on a Sunday, do you think, how awesome is it to be part of this community that God has made through Jesus that is like a taste test of what eternity is going to be like? I think sometimes on a Sunday we come maybe with a consumerism approach where we, we, we leave going, well, I got a lot out of church today or, oh, no, I'm too distracted. I didn't get anything out of church today. Uh, I think sometimes we need a realignment because church isn't about what we get. Church is about what we are. We are the new Jerusalem, God's holy city, the bride, and that will reach its ultimate fulfilment when Jesus comes back and takes us to be with him forever. Which brings me to point four, the last section of Revelation, little epilogue to finish the book off, which addresses the return. Verse six begins with a reminder that these words, i.e. the the words of this book, are faithful and true. In fact, the phrase these words gets repeated a number of times in this section. They're described as faithful and true, that the one who keeps them will be blessed, They are connected with those that are servants of the Lord God Almighty. Uh, They are important as the time is near. So listen to the trustworthy words of the Lamb. They're not to be added or taken away from, as we saw in verses 18 and 19. They are what the true and faithful witness has passed on to his witnesses in order to comfort and confront them as they live as strangers in this world, as they wait and prepare for the glorious renewal and the reality of the new heaven and the new earth. Verses 14 and 15 readdress the divide of who's in and who's out. They say, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs 
the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So there are two ways to live there, aren't there? With washed robes and the right to the tree of life, basically to accept Jesus and live with him as Lord and Saviour, or to reject him and therefore be outside. Will you be inside or outside? Now, there's uncertainty of when this will happen. I'm sure you all know this saying, two things in life are certain, death and taxes. I'm not touching taxes, that's for another day. Uh, But death, let's deal with death. Everyone is going to die or is going to be taken with Jesus to the judgment seat when he returns. We don't know when either will happen, but we do know that Jesus says he's coming soon. So when either of these definites happen... Where will you be going? And then what are you going to do with the time that you have here now? In the song I mentioned at the beginning, what are we waiting for? The chorus begins like this. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? And then this cracker. Why are we wasting all the time like someone's making more? What are you going to do with the limited time that God has graciously given you as you prepare for the definites? We don't know when it will happen, but Jesus said he's coming soon. And he means it. So, what are you waiting for? What are you preparing for? The answer to that, I think, is nothing and everything. We know that as followers of Christ, the new Jerusalem is a reality now. So there's no reason to wait. You have all you need to be a citizen of the city as you prepare for Jesus' return. So how are you going preparing? How are you going as a citizen? Are you worshipping God? Or are you making the good things God things? Are you focused on the gospel, letting it give you endurance and perseverance? Are you so captivated by the love and grace found in the gospel that as you look at the world, and the rejection, the rejection of Jesus in it, that it upsets you and you lament. Do you view the meeting of the church as a taste of what the new heaven is going to be like? And so prioritise meeting with God and his people each week. Are you helping the younger generation, teaching them, either directly in your homes or within the church family as a whole, to prepare for the definite, and not waste time on the possibilities, the good things in life that we make God things? Are you witnessing in your proclamation and your practice to those around you who will be on the outside? Because for them, they have nothing to wait for but death and misery. For those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they have everything to prepare for an amazing, glorious future dwelling with God forever. Well, Revelation's been pretty amazing, hasn't it? It's really a remarkable book. Sum it all up, Jesus wins. And he's coming back. And he's going to take his bride home forever. How good. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Almighty, thank you that Jesus is coming back. We eagerly await his return. Help us to be faithful witnesses to him while we wait for his return. Amen.